Yeah, you can clap for that. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ricky Jenkins. Welcome to Fellowship Memphis. We're a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, disciple-making church, and I'm excited to be with you in worship this morning. No particular reason to do this other than I just feel like it. If you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, will you join me in giving the Lord Jesus a round of applause and giving his name honor and glory and praise and worship and adoration, for he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, it's Sunday morning, somebody. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Uh, I'm high and a happy peacock proud to be here. I'm excited about what God is doing in our church today. It's a very special Sunday as Pastor JB has casted vision about before you this morning. It's an annual tradition where we mark a moment to remind our body that we are an equipping church in the way of coming alongside young up and coming and emerging leaders, equipping them from a number of years and then unleashing them on this nation, on this city and on this state. This is resident Sunday across all four hours. Outpost, all of our pastoral residents are preaching the gospel today, and we're really excited about that. A little bit more on that in just a couple of moments. Uh, but first, in the way of welcome, if you are a newcomer, it's your first time coming, I want to welcome you here. I want to welcome all of you who call this place home. It's just been, is anybody else's brackets busted? And anybody else kind of notice the, in my Game of Thrones voice, winter has come again? Did y'all notice the other day how it went from 20 degrees to 90? Was anybody else there? It's just been crazy. It's true March madness, and we're excited about that opportunity. I want to welcome a group here. I heard that there's a group here, the Fellowship Student Ministry of Fellowship Church in Northwest Arkansas. I was told that when I acknowledged them that they were not going to scream as loud as possible. They're here in the city serving at Memphis Athletic Ministries all week. I was told that when I said, I dare you can't scream, that they were going to out-scream me. So let's see. Hello, FSM. I dare you can't out-scream me. And they did. Uh, as we know, this time of year in spring break, a lot of groups come to Memphis to come and serve, to see what God is doing here in our city. And we want to welcome, I think it's 125 eighth graders and ninth graders who have come to serve this city fellowship. Let's welcome them and thank God for them. We're going to move right along. We want to worship in the way of our giving up to the Lord. And so I'm going to ask a couple of volunteers if you guys will come and pass around those Hobby Lobby baskets that we might continue to be wise stewards. Thank you for your continued giving to our mission. Uh, your giving is the reason that we can do what God has called us to do. Your giving is the reason that we can have resident Sundays and equip young and up and coming leaders. So thank you, as always, for your continued faithfulness in the way of giving. And indeed, if you are a guest, newcomer, You've been checking out our church. We want to thank you. I realize how precious it is that you would give us some of your time to come and visit with our body. It means a lot to us. And because of that, we've bought you lunch. Every Sunday after services, we have what we call guest lunch. It happens right after services. When you exit the auditorium, head to your right down a hallway. Notice for a guest lunch sign, we've prepared a lunch for you, steak and lobster medium. And uh, it's going to be there for you. I want to say to our 125 guests, we'll, we'll figure some out. Not today. Please, you, you may mess up the whole system. We didn't buy 125 steaks. But otherwise, if you're a guest here, we want to welcome you there. Well, as Pastor JB has cast a vision about for us on the, the video, today is Residence Sunday. Uh, the residency, I argue, is one of the most special things we do as a church. Um, we are excited not only about what God is doing in the current leadership of this church, and of other churches, we're excited about what God is going to do with up-and-coming leaders. And so for 13 years now, we've been coming alongside men and women to equip them in the way of vocational ministry and unleash them on the country. In fact, our count is upwards of around 40 men and women who have come to journey with our church for the pastoral residency. A typical resident is a young person post-college, usually uh, pursuing seminary or some sort of graduate level degree, but they come on our staff and they learn everything that we know about church and leadership. And then we unleash them. And so uh, there are people who have come to learn how to plant a church or to learn how to be a pastor or a student pastor or to learn how to do discipleship ministry in the way of our fellowship groups, you name it. Over our last 13 years, we have had it. This time of year, we are actively recruiting our next oncoming slate of pastoral residents. And we want to say to this body that this body has first dibs on the pastoral residency. Some of you are thinking about leadership, perhaps in the vocational ministry context. We want to say to you, 
pastoral residency may be, need to be something that you consider. We usually spend the spring and the summer actively recruiting, looking all over the city and the country for who God is sending us in the way of pastoral residence. So if you're interested in that, I'd love to have a conversation with you. I think they're going to flash my email up there. We would love to interest you in, as to how the pastoral residency may be God's next step of development for you. Well, I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Walter Action Jackson to the stage now. During your two or three years journeying with us in the residency, you'll experience different levels of development and equipping. Uh, we often spend several months with our guys and our gals doing some semblance of gospel or spiritual formation where we are making sure that not only do the guys and gals know that we, we want to know that they've embraced the gospel, but we also want to make sure that they can effectively translate the gospel and that they know how to live it out on a pastoral level. Uh, we expose them to leadership. So a lot of times in our church, you'll see our residents leading our volunteer teams, coming up early, staying late, being exposed to discipleship in the way of helping us pull off events where we're equipping our people or setting up our fellowship groups, uh, coming alongside our student ministries as well. You name it, we expose them to leadership. And then thirdly, and probably the most fun part, maybe not today, but the most fun part of what we do is we treat them with what we call the preaching cohort, the preaching cohort. It's a laboratory experiment, basically, for several months where we encourage the guys to hone their preaching and communicative gifts. When I started preaching 20 years ago, it was basically like they taught us how to swim. You kind of go out to the country, and they throw you in a pond, and they say, figure it out. That was kind of my introduction to preaching as well. They kind of just threw you in the pulpit and said, figure it out. I did not have the vantage point of having other peers and other leaders come alongside me to kind of monitor my gifts and coach me and challenge me and encourage me to get better and better. So one of the things we said as a church 13 years ago was that we did not want that for the people that God might be calling into ministry leadership. And so we do this every year where for several months we have a preaching cohort. It's essentially a bunch of preaching. My grandfather who discipled me used to say, it takes preaching to make a preacher. So the preaching cohort is an opportunity where our residents usually preach about 15 to 20 sermons to each other, and they get constant feedback as to how to get better and better and better and better. We make them read a lot of books, and we teach them what, how to do illustrations. We talk to them about what it means to live out the life of a preacher. We challenge them as to how they're interpreting scripture. You name it. If it's happening in preaching, it's also happening in the preaching cohort. And how proud are we of these, our sons, who are standing today to preach and deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, but I just want to say that Walter Jackson is a longtime member of this body as well as a resident. He's been one of our hardest working, and we're just excited as to what God has been doing in him. We're going to welcome him first by praying over him and anticipating what God is going to say to all of us through him. And then after we pray, I'm just going to ask you to applaud for him in the same way as if Tony Allen, Zebo, and Mark Gasol were here, okay, to just encourage our brother. So fellowship, let's welcome Walter. Now let's just stretch our hands towards our brother as we pray over him. Father God, thank you for the privilege you've given us, Lord, to shepherd and serve alongside Walter. Thank you for his faithfulness to you. Thank you for his faithfulness to his bride. Thank you for his faithfulness to his church. And we pray now, Lord God, that you would anoint him from on high, that you would give him rest and calm in your spirit, that we, you use him, Lord God, to speak a word to us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hoop and holler, y'all. Walter Jackson. Hey, Ricky. Good morning, Fellowship. Am I on? Hello? There we go. Good morning, Fellowship. Again, like um, Pastor Ricky said, my name is Walter Jackson. I'm going to give you a little info back history. Um, I grew up in a small town about two hours up the road called Charleston, Missouri. Not St. Louis. Um, not that far. But if any of you guys ever been to Lambert's? Yes. yes. Well, I'm about 15 minutes away from there. That was kind of our rival school. Um, anyway, I went to school, um, college in Missouri, and um, a week later I moved to Memphis to work with this organization called Advanced Memphis. Worked there for five years before um, leaving there and coming to the pastoral residency, and so I've been in the residency about two years now. 
Um, and so before we dive in to our passage, which will be John 15, I want to take some time to acknowledge um, some people. First, I want to acknowledge the staff and team, pastoral team at Fellowship, um, Pastor Ricky, Pastor JB, um, for your allowing young leaders to come and to learn and mess up and cut our teeth in ministry. Um, as you give us all the mistakes you made, as you pour into us, as um, you have just got us, we are grateful for you guys. Um, all the other pastors and staff who have counseled us, taken us out to countless lunches, um, I mean, we are just grateful. We could not be where we are today um, and as equipped as we are if it was not for you guys. Um, most importantly, I want to thank you, um, Fellowship Memphis, your, the body. If it was not for your faithfulness um, and your believing in our leadership and your trusting our leadership in um, not only supporting prayer but in the engagement fund, I would not be standing up here today. And so I want to say thank you, Fellowship. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Another thing I want to thank you guys for is because of the environment and the atmosphere that you created, I was able to, in the four-year colonial, look across the room and see this amazing, talented, God-fearing, just gorgeous of a woman. And through a lot of prayer and the working of the Holy Spirit, we'll be celebrating six months and three days. So, baby, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't even know where she at right now, but it don't matter. She's going to hear me. Um, she has been a constant encourager, has loved me unconditionally, has challenged me in ways um, that, man, I don't even like it, but it's beneficial. So, baby, again, thank you. Uh, she has been the sugar in my sweet tea. <laughs> She's been the Memphis to my barbecue. <laughs> She's been the Mac to my cheese. The collard to my greens. She has been all of that. Oh, yeah, thank you. I know it's 2017, we got a lot of people to eat healthy. She's also been an almond in my milk. She's been all of that, so I just want to let y'all know. Let us dive in to this John 15. Pick it up with me, starting in verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the words that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I have abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I have labeled this text, do it for the vine. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Thank you for this opportunity to come together and to worship you um, as a body. Pray that you would use me, Father, to speak the words that you would have me speak for your glory. Pray that your spirit would do what you said would do with the words, and that is to go out and not come back void. That you would penetrate hearts and minds, that you would bring people to a better understanding of you, a closer relationship with you. And Father, if there's anybody out there that don't know you, I pray today that they would be saved. Father, we ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. A last will and testament is written because what is being left behind is valuable and precious. A last will and testament usually comes about because the person has took time energy and effort to build something, and they want it taken care of in their absence. See, a last will and testament is written to give instruction, guidance, and direction so that what is theirs is properly taken care of in their absence. Ultimately, a last will and testament is written with the end in mind. Well, as we come to our text in John 15, I want you to understand that Jesus is basically giving his disciples his last will and testament. Scholars call this Jesus' farewell discourse. It ranges from John 14 and ends in John 17, 
with Jesus praying for his disciples. But for us to fully understand what Jesus is saying to his disciples, we first have to spend some time in the locker room and get in the minds of the disciples. See, the disciples were first century Jews. What that means is they memorized the first five books of the Pentateuch. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if anybody in here has spent any time in those books without falling asleep, you know how important that is. <laughs> but as we come to this text, when Jesus says, I am, what the disciples probably would have got, they probably remember back to Exodus when God, hearing the groans of Israel out of Egypt, would have came to Moses as he's reminding his business in the wilderness to enlist him to go and rescue and redeem his people. See, Moses, knowing that he did not leave Israel, Egypt, on bad terms, would have asked this question. Lord, who do I tell him sent me? And God would say to Moses in Exodus 3.14, you can look at it on the screen with me, it says, I am who I am. And say to this people, I am has sent me to you. See, what we call this is a divinity statement. It is one of eight divinity statements in the book of John. And basically what a divinity statement is, which is our first point, is saying, is Jesus saying that he is Lord. See, Jesus is not just another prophet. He's not just another good teacher. He's not just your homeboy. No, Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says it this way. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me take this off the stage and put it right in your face. Is Jesus your Lord? Not, is he the Lord of your family? Not, is he the Lord of the circle of friends that you hang out with? Not, is he the Lord of the congregation that you attend? Is Jesus your Lord? What that means is does Jesus determine how you work? Does he determine how you eat? Does he determine how you dress? Does he determine where you live? Does he determine how you treat people who don't act, think, or vote like you? Does he determine who you date? Does he determine everything in your life? Because if he is Lord, then he will. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When Jesus says he's Lord, he's saying he will not take anything less from us. That you're either going to take him as Lord of all, or you're going to take him not Lord at all. Which one? Is he your Lord? Jesus, the next thing he says in this passage is that he's the true vine. Jesus makes this statement that he's the true vine because, again, first century Jews, when they heard vine, they would have connected it to Israel. See, the psalmist wrote in 80, 8 and 9, he said, you brought a vine out of Egypt, speaking of Israel. He says, you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. See, people in that time would have heard vine. They would have thought that he was talking about Israel. See, Israel were assumed to be the chosen people of God. Israel was assumed to be the way in which God was going to bless the world. Israel was assumed to be the link between man and God. But for those of us who know our Bible, we know Israel failed miserably. That Israel could not meet the standards that God has set up on them. But when we look at Israel in a text, whenever we read Israel, I want us to not think of Israel as just some long ago distant nation. I want us to put it right in front and look at it, Israel as a mirror. See, Israel lets us know how we treat God. That we cannot meet God's requirements. We cannot satisfy God's standards. We cannot fulfill the word and the promises of God. This is our second point. 
that, man, we in and of ourselves are incapable of pleasing God. Romans 3.23 says it this way. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That there is nothing that we can do that can earn God's favor. That can give God pleasure in us. I hate to say it, but you know I don't. Your virginity ain't going to please God. Your tithes and offering ain't going to please God. Your faithfulness to your spouse ain't going to please God. Your spending your summer and spring breaks on mission trips ain't going to please God. If you are looking to those in and of themselves to please God, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're sorely mistaken. It's not going to happen. The only way that we can please God is if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Hebrew says it. This way, he says that it is impossible to please God without faith. So all those things that you're doing to please God, if you ain't doing them in so much as it is coming out of faith in Jesus, it's pointless. It's worthless. Isaiah says our most righteous acts are like filthy rags. I'm here to tell you that nothing we can do can earn us anything with God. But I want to tell you that God in his faithfulness, in his love, in his mercy, in his grace, in his power, said, I'm not going to leave you guys in this state of hopelessness. He said, I'm going to do something for you. And 2,000 years ago, he got off his throne in heaven, wrapped himself in flesh, came down, lived the perfect life, died a death that you would not deserve so that we could have a hope in him. Is your hope in Jesus? Is your faith in Jesus? Is your trust in Jesus? If it's not, then you are in a, on a beeline of hell. Just going to be honest with you. See, what we understand is that Jesus coming and dying on the cross and raising again, it was Jesus that was the chosen one of God. It was Jesus that was the way in which he was going to bless the world. It was Jesus that's the only link between man and God that anything else is sinking sand. Do you trust him? So we talked about Jesus being Lord. We've talked about that in and of ourselves we are incapable of pleasing God. But our third point, which Jesus is stressing in this passage, is he's stressing to his disciples to abide in him. Ten times in 11 verses does Jesus say abide in me. If you're familiar with John, you understand it. Jesus just, at the Last Supper, told his disciples that you were going to abandon him, that you were going to leave him, that you guys were going to scatter. So how do we get from Jesus telling his disciples that y'all are going to leave me hanging literally to now him telling them to abide in him? First, we have to understand then what abide in me means. See, abide in me doesn't mean that you never turn your back on God. Abide in me doesn't mean that you have a perfect track record with God. Abide in me doesn't mean that you never doubt your faith, your salvation, or even God. That's not what that means. Abide in me means that in the midst of all of that, you come back to God. A few years into my walk with the Lord, God began to reveal some sin that was in my heart. And as God began to reveal it, I began to realize that I was trying to manage it and not get rid of it, not die to it. As time went on, 
And I looked up, I realized I had both hands on this sin, and I was, my back was turned again on God. And I realized I had to make a decision. Was I going to forgo everything that I had learned and known about Jesus for this sin, or was I going to let it go and trust Jesus and cling to Jesus? Well, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the grace of God, I was able to let go and cling to God. I said, it's going to be Jesus or nothing at all. Have you clung to Jesus? Let me put it to you another way. I'm considered an old soul. I grew up in a house where my mom would uh, play oldie but goldies. For those of you who don't know, ask somebody over 30. But I, I grew up listening to music, and, man, I fell in love with it. Matter of fact, I'll take that music back then over what's on the radio today. I'm sorry. I, don't, I can't stand it. It, it. it don't mean that. It don't make sense to me. See, some of y'all look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. See, I know a little something about the shy lights. I know a little something about the floaters. I know a little something about the OJs. Gladys Knight and the Pips. Yes, Pips. I saw y'all waiting on me to catch me and say Pimps. No, it's Pips. I got that one. But my favorite group of all time sang hits like The Way You Do the Things You Do. Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Just My Imagination. My Girl. That's right. The Temptations. For those of you who don't know who that is, it's an all-male R&B group that signed to Motown. But think about Temptations I want to talk to you about. That Whenever they performed, it was five Temptations, one mic. So, man, when they come out there, they spin out, kick that leg out, <laughs> shoot them up, come right back to the mic. Well, I'm here to tell you what Jesus is telling his disciples is the same thing he's telling us today. He said, take a page out of Temptations book. That no matter what temptation is pulling you, tugging your heart, find your way back to the mic. So you may find yourself over here in total disregard for God, not knowing what's going on, but find your way back to the mic. You may find yourself over here, your marriage is shaky, the job just downsized and you got kicked out, your kids are wayward, you don't know what to do, but find your way back to the mic. You may find yourself back here believing the lies of the world, not caring, not knowing, doubting and wondering if God is even worth it, but my, I'm here to tell you, find your way back to the mic. Jesus is telling Jesus isn't going anywhere. He made a promise to us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's big enough to handle all of our doubts, all of our fears, all of our struggles. Find your way back to him. Why? Why do we need to find our way back to Jesus? There's a couple of reasons. First reason is that he died for you. He shed his perfect and precious blood for you. And he did it thinking about you. Another thing is that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to crack the sky. He's going to come down. He's going to do away with pain, sickness, death, hurt, evil. He's going to establish his perfect kingdom. And we are going to be able to live in perfect peace with our Savior. And he's saying, just wait on me until then. Just remain in me until then. Just trust me until then. It's going to happen. Another reason that we should abide in Jesus is that there's no other place where you can find true joy and peace in the midst of your circumstances. Stop looking. You ain't going to find it. So as we prepare to come to a close, I know there are some of you out there who have never trusted Jesus. I'm here to tell you, you can trust them today. That you can have a new life, that you can walk out of this auditorium, a brand new person, a brand new man, a brand new woman. If you put your faith in him, if you trust what he's done for you. I know then there's some of us who are trusting God right now. And I'm here to encourage you, keep trusting. Keep abiding, keep waiting, keep the faith, even when it gets tough. And then there's others. You're going through a difficult time, a difficult season. And you've been distant. 
You've been running. You don't know what to do. But I'm here to remind you. I'm here to tell you. Shoot up. <laughs> Come back to the mic. He's waiting on you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your message. Pray that you would continue to glorify yourself through the work of your spirit, Father. Pray that you would give us what we needed, Father, that you would, if there's anybody out there who is struggling, pray that you would let them know that you are there and you are waiting for them. If there's anybody that don't know you, I pray that you would bring them to yourself. Pray that people would come out away, Father, being encouraged, being challenged, Father, but also you reigniting the fire that you have set in us. See, in Son of Jesus' name we pray. Amen.